Hello, welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This time I'm starting off Nintendo Power's third year with a look at Nintendo Power issue number 14 for July of 1990. Let's get started. Our cover for this issue features Chippendale Rescue Rangers. The cover has a combination of provided art assets and a diorama, with Chippendale leaping away from a window as Fat Cat looks on. Fat Cat in the window and the falling chip look just fine, but Dale doesn't quite fit. I guess this is part of what you get when you have to combine provided art with original stuff. In the letters column, we have another story of the Terminator-like invulnerability of the NES. With an NES from St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands, surviving Hurricane Hugo. For those of you who are too young to remember, St. Uh, Hugo was a Category 5 hurricane, a lot like Hurricane Katrina. The next article in the issue is the continuation of our Final Fantasy strategy guide. However, again, as Final Fantasy is getting a full, dedicated strategy guide issue later, I'm going to hold off on the full review until then. As it stands, this issue has a recap of the story this far, including some advice on recommended party levels, before giving a full world map and walking the player through the game up until the point where you get your advanced classes. In Howard and Nestor, the guys meet up with the characters from Super C, who are having some difficulty getting past a boulder. For the Summer CES coverage, we get a lot more focus on the games that were at Summer CES, particularly Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game, and Dr. Mario, which we will definitely be seeing in later issues of the magazine. Our next game article is for one of Capcom's classic Disney games, Chippendale Rescue Rangers. The article has maps of all the levels in the game's first world, as well as a map to the structure of the next world, which introduces a little Super Mario Bros. 2 non-linearity into the mix. Gameplay-wise, Rift Chippendale's Rescue Rangers is a game with a difficulty that definitely falls into the category of tough but fair. The controls are excellent and responsive, and the enemies aren't too difficult to overcome once you learn the ropes. The difficulty learn leans towards learning how to cope with different types of enemies. Once you've learned how to beat them, navigating the levels becomes simpler, though you still have to keep on your toes and be paying attention, otherwise the game will kick your ass. Pardon my language. The game also has two-player simultaneous co-op as well. I'd say that this game is a serious contender for pick of the issue. Next is a NES-only sequel to Metal Gear with Snake's Revenge. In particular, this is a sequel that Hideo Kojima, the creator of Metal Gear, was not involved with in any way, and which has nothing to do with the official sequel to Metal Gear, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, which came out for the MSX2. The article gives maps for the first few areas of the game, including the side-scrolling sections. Honestly, this game is much harder than it has any right being, and is more deliberately obtuse than it has any right being. Right off the bat, the game gives you this odd section where you're evading spotlights on dark screens, where you can't actually see the rest of the environment except for the portions that are illuminated by spotlights and flares. But if you go in those spotlights, everything's illuminated, except now you're being swarmed by enemies. And if you're spotted, you're almost certainly going to die as you run into enemies that can shoot diagonally when you can't, and you'll likely end up... If you, even, if you, even if you survive the first few screens, you're not going to get through these ones. Um, so, I tried using a Game Genie code to get through the first part of the first level, which would allow me to trigger the sensors without getting killed and getting a game over, and which would allow me to reach the, the entrances in my only life. However, in order to make this work, you have to trigger an event to basically cause a cutscene where one of your teammates, you have teammates in this game, um, distracts a guard and gets captured so that you can get into the door of an area. I wasn't able to get this to trigger. I don't know if there's an issue with the Game Genie code causing a problem, or what. But in any case, if you... and if, if the game is requiring squad mates to trigger cutscene, it, it's just, it's a mess. It's a mess is what it is. It's The game is more complex to a certain extent than I think the NES is really capable of in terms of narrative stuff like triggering cutscenes to get guards distracted and all this, that, and the other thing. Plus, the game won't let you kill the guards to unlock the, and let, unlock the door that way. It's, it's kind of weirdly bad in terms of 
how many things it manages to get horribly wrong in the first segment of the game. All this added complexity just makes the game less enjoyable as the result. I mean, later Metal Gear games add considerable amounts of complexity and make things work. I mean, hell, the, on the everything from the PlayStation on is considerably more complex than these ones. But I guess the situation here is the level of complexity that the people who designed the NES version wanted to include is a level of complexity that the NES simply cannot handle at all, leading to the problems we have here. So, honestly, just skip this game. Entirely. In classified information, we get all three continue codes for Double Dragon 2, along with the Konami code variant for Super C. Has also a password for Burai Fighter, which maxes out all your weapons, and which I used when I recorded my now lost gameplay footage for when I was doing that game. So, um, moving on. Gogo 13 returns in the Mafiat Conspiracy. Or Mafat Conspiracy, rather. The article basically gives advice for every act of the game. The Mafat Conspiracy does right everything that Gogo 13 Top Secret Episode did wrong. The color palette is brighter and more varied. The controls are better. You can shoot while you're crouching. There are unlimited continues. The only thing I miss about the first game, and it seems weird to miss this, is I miss the random sequences where all of a sudden you go in the first person and fend off snipers and other assailants on the ground. If only because, in the original game, when you completed those sequences, you got health back by succeeding in those sequences. And we don't have anything like that here particularly when you're doing the city exploration portion of the game. Still, while the first game was an interesting failure, I consider the Moffat Conspiracy as an unreserved success and a definite improvement over Duke Togo's video game outing. The fact that this is Duke Togo's final video game outing makes this whole thing even more of a bummer, as I think later titles in the series, or later titles based around the character, probably could have improved on the whole thing even, even more. Next is Solstice, which is an isometric puzzle platformer, which is a worrisome combination for me. The article features a map of the first level of the dungeon. Solstice's biggest flaw is the combination of isometric perspective and platforming. I find it, find it very, very hard to judge the height of my jumps, the depth of my jumps, as far as length of how far I need to go, um and numerous other factors when I'm dealing with an isometric perspective. Further, in an isometric perspective game of this era, there's no way to rotate the camera, so if something's behind something else, you can't see it. And which is particularly obnoxious if a item that you need falls behind something else, and you have to judge where it is. There are places where the isometric perspective works in gaming. All of those places are strategy games. Turn-based strategy games specifically. Games like XCOM, tactical RPGs like the Sagaya, the Tactics Ogre games, or Final Fantasy Tactics. With Solstice, I just can't get a good approximation of where my characters need to be, what movements I need to make to complete the game's jumps, and just generally what needs to be done to deal with the game's puzzles because of the camera angle. I realize that there are players who are, ably, who are able to facially figure all this stuff out, both at the time and now. I'm particularly, I suspect, British fans of ZX Spectrum, Spectrum games, particularly since they made a lot of isometric platformer puzzle platformers for the ZX Spectrum. You all are probably really good at this kind of stuff. You've trained your brain to think in those fashions. I have problems with these type of games, with the camera angles, and just generally causing problems with, with me not being able to wrap my brain around the puzzles. If you have the same problems I do with these, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with you. If you're able to do these in your sleep, great, more power to you. I'm looking at these games from my perspective, not your perspective. I'm going by me. Moving on to something better, or in my perspective better, SNK has their take on the Ease and Legend of Zelda formula of action RPG with Crystallis. The article gives info on who provides what spells, as well as maps with the first few of the first few areas. 
What the article does not say, which needs to be said, is that in order to beat some of the bosses, you must be at a certain level to do any damage to the boss. If you are underleveled, you will simply not be able to hurt the boss, and you'll just have to you'll just have to die and go back to town and start grinding until you reach the right level. That said, this leads to Crystallis' biggest problem, the grinding. You have to grind to buy equipment upgrades. You have to grind to buy quest items. You have to grind to be at a sufficient level to do damage to bosses. That said, this isn't a terrible game. I mean, e the E series had plenty of grinding as well, and this game does the combat formula that Ease does without dropping the bump combat in there as well. And it implements slashing combat better than the ports of Ease that also implement slashing combat have done. Additionally, the game gives you a ranged sword attack like Legend of Zelda's, but you don't have to be at full health to do it. You can do it at any time, just so long as you're able to charge up your sword. So, I'd say of all of the Zelda-inspired action RPGs that are in the Ease series out there, this is definitely one of the best. In fact, I might even say it's comparable to the original Ease games, at least in terms of difficulty and design. Maybe not music. Next, we get to some of the Game Boy titles with the uh, port of the original Double Dragon for the Game Boy. And the article gives us a map of the first three levels. Double Dragon on the Game Boy plays like Double Dragon, with the distinct difference that the game's camera is closer in, so everything looks bigger. And all the buttons are connected to attack types rather than attack directions. In the original Double Dragon for the NES, you had attack left and attack right, and depending on what button you hit, determined whether the attack was a punch or a kick. Here, it's just kick but kick attack and a punch attack, and you always attack in the direction you're facing. Which is how it should be. That said, this game has a lot more platforming than the original Double Dragon did on the NES, which is a problem, because the platforming in Double Dragon games is terrible. Which is unfortunate, because were it not for the increased platforming, this would be the superior version of Double Dragon, and actually, without with the platforming completely taken out, I would say this game would be the perfect version of Double Dragon. Alas, it's, it just had to settle for slightly better. Wizards and Warriors has received a more compact and streamlined release for the Game Boy in Wizards and Warriors Chapter X. I'm not sure what happened to the other eight chapters. Uh, we get maps of the game's first stage. Wizards and Warriors X actually fixes a bunch of the problems with the NES version of, of the Wizards and Warriors games, though it still introduces some new problems of its own. The levels are smaller, though they have some space to explore, the attack animations are much, much better, and they actually feel effective, as opposed to the sort of flailing about that you get from the uh, NES games. Also, the game lets you discern between attacking enemies or uh, coming from straight ahead, attacking from above, and gives you different attack animations depending on how you want to do this. Unfortunately, Wizards and Warriors X still has some problems that make things less enjoyable. First, the game is guilty of one of my little pet peeves. The character is animated with a shield in hand that doesn't actually do anything. However, a greater sin is a change for the better done horribly wrong. When you die, you respawn exactly where you fell. Now, when you're fighting normal enemies, this is fine. This puts you right, right where you were, and it's actually really helpful with boss fights and helping you get through those. But, if you miss a jump, instead of simply losing a life, you get an instant game over. I would have thought that the game developers would have figured out how to have a character respawn on the nearest piece of solid ground if they miss a jump, but that's just me. Still, Wizards and Warriors X is a definite improvement over the last few titles in the series, and it's a decent game, but it's not quite enough for me to recommend it. We then have previews of Final Fantasy Legend, um, The Amazing Spider-Man, Penguin Wards, and Dexterity, all for the Game Boy, along with Game Boy ports of Pipe Dream, Paperboy, Lock and Chase, and Wheel of Fortune. Next up is a preview of Castlevania 3, which gives a rundown of the four playable characters, um, your typical Belmont, plus three more who you can recruit later on. 
um, you can get throughout the game, in addition to a discussion of the password system, which uses a symbol-based password, along with entering a name to go with it. Speaking of games with multiple playable characters, we have a look at Maniac Mansion, which gives us a look at the complete cast of the game, both people who you can take in the mansion with you and who you will encounter inside the mansion. And we wrap up our multiple playable character trifecta with Mission Impossible, with info on each of the members of the IMF team, along with the gameplay, which appears to be modeled on the gameplay of Metal Gear, which fits really well into the concept of the show. In the top 30, the Arabian Nights-themed RPG The Magic of Scheherazade is on the list. In Counselor's Corner, we get two questions about the bosses in Batman. Notable titles in the new games column for this issue are Spot, the first video game appearance of 7-Up's mascot character in a video game with an Othello clone, and Dungeon Magic, Sword of the Elements, a first-person dungeon crawler with some overworld exploration to it, like with Might and Magic. In video shorts, we have a look at Rad Racer 2 from Square, and Nexsoft's NES port of Wizardry, Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord. We also have a look at Heavy Shredden, which I think is the first snowboarding video game we've seen thus far. In the NES journal, we get a tie-in article for the Maniac Mansion preview with a profile of Lucasfilm Games, which is later renamed to LucasArts. The article focuses on the business side of the company instead of the creative side, which sadly means that we have no interviews with Ron Gilbert, who worked on Maniac Mansion. We also have an article profiling some of the drivers who have lent their names to video games, specifically Ivan Iron Man Stewart, Al Unser Jr., Bill Elliott, and Michael Andretti. It's kind of nice, since we haven't really had any celebrity profiles in a while, and I don't think we'll get any more in the foreseeable future. We also have a selection of images for a little photo journal piece on the 1990 Nintendo World Championships, including a really great look at the main stage. Uh, Capcom has several notable titles coming up, particularly Little Nemo, based on the film, which is in turn based on the very, very long-running comic strip. My pick of the week for this week is Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers for both my single-player and my multiplayer pick. Capcom made an excellent platformer, and one which I think has been somewhat underappreciated, especially in comparison to, well, DuckTales. Actually, I do kind of hope that Capcom and Disney um, do something that gives Chippendale's Rescue Rangers the same sort of graphical overhaul that um, DuckTales got earlier in, well, okay, not earlier, but last year. And I'd love to play that at some point in the future. Next issue is the Ninja Gaiden 2 Strategy Guide. So the episode will be a little shorter and focusing entirely on one game. Um, if you enjoyed this show and you'd like to know when the next episode comes out, please subscribe to my YouTube ch to my channel and give this video a thumbs up. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.